Good morning, and welcome to my show, Moments with Melinda. My guest today is Mick Lee. Hi, Mick. How you doing? Hey, Melinda. Good to see you. It's so good to see you, my friend. It's been a while. It has. It sure has. Well, let me introduce you quickly to my viewers. Mick Lee is a musician, songwriter, singer, and author of Undiscovered Dinosaur, Adventures with Rock Legends of the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Undiscovered Dinosaur. Is that you? That's me. You're the undiscovered. <laughs> it's actually a pretty good description of what I am. You're an, I don't know. I don't think you're much of a dinosaur. You're such a rock and roller. Um, yeah. And you move pretty fast too, Mick. You don't, you don't, you don't, you don't leave much of a trail. That's for sure. So um, I want to thank you for being on my show. Uh, I really appreciate it. Um, and I did, I did a lot of research and you, there's a lot of great stuff out there about you, but I want to start by talking a bit about your growing up in New York city and how you got into music. Yep. Um, it, you know, New York city was my town. I love New York city. Uh, I was a big Yankee fan. My dad used to take me to Yankee games. Uh, and there was something about the atmosphere of New York city in, you know, in the fifties that was just, you could cut it with a knife. It was awesome. Uh, and I remember it really well, considering it was a while ago. Um, and my mom was a stay-at-home mom and she was bored. So my dad brought home a guitar that one of his clients made, forbade me to play it. I wasn't allowed to touch it. But my mom took pity on me because I was very curious she had a clothes cupboard that was about four feet wide and six feet deep. She would take me into her clothes cupboard and show me a few chords, you know, on the QT kind of thing. And then eventually my dad found out and it was all good. And I would bring out the guitar after family dinners. You know, we used to have a lot of family dinners. I'd bring out the guitar and I'd torture them with, uh, you know, we've got to sing to Bismarck or uh, got the songs that were around in those days. And, you know, my family were very indulgent. And uh, that's how I got started. I must have been about, I guess it was nine or 10 years old. Very cool. So, so, you, like, were, so you were self-taught. Yeah, pretty much. My mom showed me like three or four chords. And you, and and you, I took, and you came from a musical background because your mom was also a singer, right? She was. She was a singer and a dancer in the West End in London. She was pretty good. Well, you know, talk talk to us. There's a great story about you, um, of you playing in Rapallo, Italy at the age of 12 and then going back and then 20 years later. Tell us that story. It's a great story. It was very cool. I have to say my dad was also a musician. He was a pretty good pianist and had a really good voice. So both sides of the family, you know, we had music. <laughs> so uh, one year we, we moved to London when I was 12 uh, both my parents had grown up in London so we moved back to London which was very traumatic for me but one of the good things was we went on vacation to Rapallo in Italy and there was a, a cafe there a cafe restaurant right on the seafront and my brother who's four years younger than I we used to sit in with the band. The guitarist would let me borrow his electric guitar, which is great. And my brother would sing harmonies and, and everybody loved us. We were two American kids who were singing in Italian. You know, you want to get to Italians, that's the way to do it. You know, and it was... You know, and all those kind of goofy songs from the 60s. Um, so anyway, that was that. And then about 20 years later, my brother was on tour with Eric Clapton. He was a tour manager. And they had a day off, and he and Clapton and some of the band went to Rapallo and had lunch at this restaurant where he and I used to play. And Dave mentioned it to the waiter. He said, you know, my brother and I used to play here. And the waiter looked at him and he said, Dave? Michael and David? He recognized him after 20 years. And the owner came out, all the, all the waiters came out, and they made a big fuss of Dave. 
and he's sitting next to Eric Clapton, who they completely ignored. I had no idea who Clapton was. I'm making a big fuss of David. And Clapton got a huge laugh out of it. He was cracking up laughing. It was really funny. It's a great yeah. story, Mick. It's yeah. a great story. I love it. So you did mention that you did move to London, which was quite traumatic for you when you were 12, but you started the band, The Collegiate, Collegiate, when yeah. you, and you played for Princess Margaret, Margaret at a charity function. Talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, that was our big claim to fame. At, at, uh, uh, it was a benefit for the Imperial Cancer Society or something, and she was the, you know, the patron. And she had quite a reputation back in the day, Princess Margaret, you know. So anyway, I think we played about a 40 minute set. And then afterwards, this guy came backstage and he was saying how wonderful we were and he wanted to take over our management and he was gonna make us the next Beatles and all this stuff, none of which of course happened, you know. But it was my first taste of music business and nonsense, let's put it that way, you know what I mean? I mean there's a wonderful book about a manager in the music business. And the first sentence is, hello, he lied. Sounds up the music business in three words. Hello, he lied. What's that mean? Well, how can you lie when you're saying hello? You know, anytime a, a, you know, a manager or anyone on the business side of things says something to you, you have to take it with a pinch of salt. I was very fortunate in that the managers that I had were all, they were all honest with me. None of them tried to diddle me, but they were all busy with bigger acts, you know? Right. Uh, one of my managers worked with Tina Turner and Paul McCartney. He's actually out on tour with Paul McCartney now. <clears throat> They're in Australia. He's 83 and he's out on tour with Paul McCartney. Oh, that's yeah. fascinating. So, Mick, you dropped out of school at 17. Um, and in a short time, you got connected to Chris Wood. Um, and Chris Wood played with Traffic, which is Stevie Winwood's band. Talk yep. to us a little bit about um, dropping out of school. Why did you drop out of school? Did you ever get your graduate degree from high school and uh, or not? Maybe, I, obviously, you didn't need it if you were a talented musician, maybe. But and then soon, shortly after that, you're connected with one of the, the the lead musicians with the Stevie Winwood band, Traffic. Talk to us about that. What what was what motivated you yeah. to leave school? Why did you leave? School? I wound up actually getting a BA years later. You did. That's right. I read about that. I so did. Yeah, I got a BA. Yeah. Good for you. But the way I met Chris Wood was very bizarre. I was in the West End of London. I was crossing a busy street. And there was another long hair leaning up against a traffic light. So he said, hello, as I crossed the road. And I said, hey, I could tell he was American. So we got chatting and it turned out we were both American musicians in London. And, you know, so we were just comparing notes. After less than five minutes, he said, you don't have to know where I can get some weed, do you? And I said, yeah, as a matter of fact, I had a friend around the corner. He peeled off 300 bucks in cash. He's just met me on a street corner. Because I'm staying at Chris Wood's house and he gives me the address. It's just around the corner. Can you grab us an ounce and bring it around to the house? I said, sure. I doubted that it was Chris Wood, but I what the hell? <laughs> I went and got the weed. I walked over there and sure enough, it was Woody's house, you know. So we got high and we started talking and he was asking me about what kind of music I made, yada, yada, yada. And after about a half an hour, we're all sitting there stoned. He said, come up to the studio. Let's let's see what you got, kind of thing. Woody was very relaxed. He was, he was a great guy. I loved him like a brother. So we just started jamming. And uh, that was it. We just, after that, I was there almost every day for a long time. We became really close friends. And we did some recording together. His house was Musician Central. Give you an idea, I'm sitting there listening in the studio one night <clears throat> to some stuff that we'd recorded that day. Long hair walks in and leans up against the wall with a red kerchief. 
listening, you know. So when the tape ended, I turned it off and he says to me, no, I really like that. That's really good. He said, next time you go in the studio, give me a call. I like to come in and play with you. So I had no idea who the guy was, but I figured if he's at Woody's house, he must be able to play, right? I said, sure, no problem. I went next door into the living room and I said to Woody, there's a long hair with the red kerchief. He wants to come to the studio with us and play. He looked at me, he says, Paul Kossoff, Mick. Paul Kossoff, the guitarist in Free, was one of the best known guitarists in Britain. Wow. And still today, he's considered one of the great guitarists of all time. What a, what a great story. What a great wow. story. So, Ross and I uh, became like brothers. You know, we, we played together for years. So, were your parents supportive of you dropping out of school and becoming a, and hooking up with all these, at the time, you know, up and rising uh, rock rock bands had did they support your your endeavors my dad thought i was crazy you know he said you've got to have a, a job you know and i actually tried for a few months i went to work in his office and then he realized i wasn't cut out for business what know? did he do what did your dad do yeah an import export company okay. he imported okay. things and export uh, my mom was very supportive because she had been a, you know, a dancer and a singer and what have you. And they, and she knew you had talent. She, she probably your father did too. Uh, my dad eventually became a big fan. Good, good. He used to like my song, the songs that I wrote, but it took a while. And, you know, I was a wild child. I probably didn't start, said, I bummed around Europe playing music uh, from the time I was 17 until... Around 24, I began to go up. I was about 24. That sounds like all of us. I mean, I'm 73 and I still haven't grown up. So, <laughs> I think, so there's something about, I mean, Mick, you and I are about, the, I think I'm a little older than you by about mm -hmm. a year. But I think there's something about our generation that there is this child that lives within us because we had to be so serious and we were so serious back growing up with the Vietnam War and everything that was going on in our, there's certainly a lot more going on with our children's lives now, which we're going to talk about in a bit. So right. let, let's segue to the years. What brought you to Vermont? You spent 20 years in Vermont where you became the sports director. I didn't know you were into sports, but obviously. No, not the sports director. The sales, you? The oh, you became director. the sales director. I'm sorry. Well, that makes all the sense in the world. I was like sport. So, but it does say sports in something I read about you, but you were the sales director, which makes all the sense of work. Because I think you, I think you could sell anything to anybody um, at Clear Channel in Burlington, Vermont. So, what brought you here? Talk to us a little bit about your about about that about coming to Vermont. Right, my ex um, had custody of our child at the time. He moved back to Vermont, and our daughter was like three and a half, four years old, and I wasn't going to miss her growing up. So. Um, I had a completely other career uh, that went kind of alongside my music career as a gestalt therapist. I had trained as a gestalt therapist. Talk, talk, to, talk to my viewers very quickly about gestalt, just for a second. Right. Go ahead. It's about group management. Gestalt is about process and how to help people in a group get to the point where they can help each other. Okay. That's thanks. really what it's about. Good. So you and were a best so, therapist and you moved to Vermont to be near your daughter. Smart move. Go on. So I couldn't go back on the road as a musician because I wanted to be around for my daughter. I had to reinvent myself, basically. And uh, a friend of mine worked in radio. And I had started uh, producing radio jingles. I had to do something. So I was writing and producing radio jingles for local businesses, you know. And this friend of mine said, look, you know how to write and produce ads. Why don't you try selling radio? So I got a job um, with WIZN to begin with. And um, I found that the fact that I could write and produce advertising differentiated me from all the other salespeople. You know, they were going in and telling clients, we've got the best radio stations and the most listeners and yada, yada, yada. I went in and I asked them a bunch of questions so that I found out what made their business different. And then I would produce an ad or at least a script. And I said, this is how I think we should promote your business. 
didn't say a word about my radio station. You became an ad, you became an ad man, a mad yeah. man, an ad man. Yeah, a mad man. Yeah, you could say that. <laughs> I was never very far from being a madman anyway, Melinda, as you know well. As I know. Yeah. So anyway, uh, this, as I say, differentiated me from the other salespeople. And I became very successful because I was selling ideas. And they were valuable to people. And when they worked, my clients made money. You know, within a few years, I was a sales manager and training other salespeople in how to do this. And my gestalt skills, my group management skills, were a huge help to me. So I was using my writing and production skills, a musician, and producing the ads. And I was using my group management skills as a manager. And if I said so myself, I began to use it. That's outstanding. I enjoyed myself. It was fun. That's outstanding. So so I know. <laughs> I know that while you were in Vermont, you you played your music because you played a couple times down here on the meadow. Um, yeah. sh share with my viewers some of the experiences that you had playing with so many of the local musicians in Vermont, many of them who are still here in their 70s making music. Talk to us a little bit about that experience with some of the locals that you yeah. played with. One of the things I've been very fortunate with and blessed by, Melinda, uh, is that uh, when I went traveling, when I left London and came to Vermont, it was the first stop. I had this uh, good fortune to run into these amazing players. You know, Burlington's not a huge town. It's a fairly small city. But the first week I was there, I ran into some musicians who were world-class players, you know. And who and were they? Just... Mention, mention some of their names, because I'm sure they might be watching this. Ron Rost was the first one that I met from the New Nile Orchestra. Uh, Ron's a fabulous player. You know, in the New Nile, we're well known up and down the East Coast. Uh, Iflu Kildane was an actual Ethiopian musician who fronted the band. And we just became great friends. And through Ron, Ron knew every musician in Vermont. And then... <clears throat> I have had a bit of bad cold moment. Anyway, through him, I met Gus Zeising, who plays in Mango Jam, who had a recording, a recording studio. So, of course, I had to go into the studio and record the songs I was writing, you know. And a good friend of mine. Do you know, time, I'm going to stop you just for a second because I just want you to yeah. know that Gus Zeising was my first tenant, one of my oldest and first tenants at Main Street Landing in the Union Station, up in that little studio in the corner on the third floor, my first tenant. So Gus, we love you, Gus. Okay, continue. Yes. Continue. I spent hours in Gus's studio driving him crazy, you know. Continue we got along on. Great. Continue Gus on. Gus played on a lot of my stuff as well as recording it. He plays sax, sometimes drums, you know, great guy, Gus. Emily. Uh, anyway, um, I... I, I had a friend at the time who was managing Cheryl Crow. He had interest me. Uh, he had uh, started working with Cheryl when she was in Michael Jackson's band. And I went and visited them on the bad tour. He introduced me to Cheryl. Cheryl and I did some singing together. Our voices went really well together. And she asked me to write us a duet. About to get a record deal, and she said, well, <coughs> excuse me. As I was writing songs, I'd go into Gus's studio, record them, and I'd send them to Scooter, managing Cheryl, in case he could get covers, you know, get other artists to record them, which made a nice, you know, side income. Uh, so, so Vermont, going back to Vermont, um, since this is a Vermont show, um, are you in touch with any of the musicians who are still here playing music? Do you ever? We stay in touch on Facebook. So you, so you do stay in touch. Um, yeah. So so to all of the musicians out there who have played with you, um, I hope you're watching this and um, you remember those days. Uh, let's. So so why why did you leave Vermont? What what took you away from Vermont, Mick? Before we get that, I just want to say something about oh. Joe Burrell. 
Oh, good. Oh, Big Joe Burrell, of course. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. My yes. first weekend in Vermont was the, the jazz festival. And Big Joe Burrell and the Unknown Blues Band. I thought I got to go see them. They got a great name, you know. So I'm at the bar having a drink and Big Joe walks up to me and we get talking. Found out I was a musician. He said, backstage with me, me. So, okay. And just before they went back on, he invited me to sit in with them the next song. So I said, great, let's do God Bless the Child, which is what we did. Paul Asbell was the guitarist in that band. Paul starts playing a solo. Big Joe walks over to me on stage, throws his arm around my shoulder and says, I hear you, I hear you. And ever after, whenever I went to see them, he always invited me. Oh, that's beautiful. What a great story. Um, Paul, and I interviewed Paul for my show just a, a few <coughs> ago. What, what a great guy. I mean, all these musicians are still here. They're still playing music. Yeah. And, um, so uh, so you left Vermont and you, I believe you went to New Orleans and you ended up um, settling in North Carolina. But before we get there, um, you, you, you talked to me a bit about the work of the Findhorn Foundation and how you got involved as a professional counselor and transformational coach. Yes. The Findhorn Foundation is a, a, a UN affiliate and that's where they started talking to plants meditating with plants back in the 60s. They started growing these 40 pound cabbages, you know, and the BBC found out about it and they sent a, a you know, a, a spit of sandy soil uh, on the Northeast Scottish coast. So the BBC went out and filmed their gardening work, which is very unusual. And from that TV documentary, it became famous all over the world. People came to visit from all over the world. And <clears throat> a big part of their work was group work, transformational group work, and spiritual work, both of which were things that I had been, you know, deeply immersed in. So I wound up running workshops at the foundation and meeting people from all over the world. It was wonderful. I had a really good time. That's very cool. So we're going to move into, um, I could talk to you for hours, but we're going to move into, because we're coming down to the last third of our show. Um, I, I want to talk to you about your memoir, Undiscovered Dinosaurs. Um, what inspired you to write it? Um, and and uh, talk to us a little bit about, about your book. <clears throat> you know, I had... I made a living on the road as a musician for almost 20 years. I was very fortunate, uh, had a lot of lucky breaks, but record companies did not like what I did because it was very eclectic. For example, um, Sting lived not far from me. He used to go out running the same hills, Sting and I. So I had a tape of some of our songs messengered over to him. He listened it, listened to it on his way to do a radio interview. And he liked it so much that he talked about us in the radio interview. How wonderful Mick Lee and his band were. <clears throat> he called me after the interview. And I went to see him at his gig that night backstage at the Albert Hall. And he said to me, bring me another tape tomorrow, Mick. I'm going to give it to my manager. I'd like to produce your band. I'd ask him. I thought, great. So that same friend who wound up managing Cheryl Crow was the PR guy on that tour. He overheard Sting talking to his manager and he called me, he said, Sting's going to do it. He wants to, you know, produce your band. Three days later, I get a call from the head of A&R at his record label, the record label. Am I allowed to use the F word? Probably you not can. okay, and but maybe said, not. I'm, I don't know. Then, when... Mick, I don't give a lusty F what Sting thinks. I told my CEO that if he signs the band over my head, even and I'm taking my bands with me, even though Sting said during our record. Wow, well, I'm so sorry about that, but let's go back to your book. 
I want because we oh, were yeah. anyway, well, that's... Out of time. I only have six minutes left. So talk to because I want to talk to you about Muhammad Ali and I have other things I want to talk to you about. Right. Um to, let's uh, anyway, back. that was why I wrote the book. Okay, that's why you wrote the book. Okay, to get all this this history out about your life. It was um, sitting in me and I had to get it out somehow. Well, I'm glad well, I'm glad you got it out. I want to tell my viewers that it's I don't know if they can find it locally. This is a Vermont show, locally in Vermont, but they certainly, if they want to can go and get it on Amazon. It's called uh, Undiscovered Dinosaurs. And I want to send- No, single, Undiscovered Dinosaur. Soar. Undiscovered yeah, Dinosaur. dinosaur. Yeah. Oh, I would say, so that's my bad here. I'm thinking all the all the musicians that you worked, that you worked with were the under, okay. So anyway, I want to send my viewers to your website, which is Mick Lee, which is M-I-C-K-L-E-E, -E, music.com if they want to learn more about you so yeah. let's let's um so i did read some of your memoir and one of the things i wanted to, you to talk about because i thought it was such an inspiration was meeting muhammad ali and his impact on you and about his speech the real cause of man's distress can you share that with us mick muhammad was uh, like a guru of mine i really appreciated a, how good he was at what he did, how hard he worked, and that he shared his good fortune with poor people. He wasn't satisfied just to make millions of dollars. He wanted to help less fortunate people. One thing he said I really liked was, um, the rent you, you pay for your time here on earth is your service to others. Service to others is the rent you pay for your time here on earth. So anyway, I, <clears throat> I went to see him give a speech and afterwards I ran into him backstage and this big busy bodyguard who tried to come to Muhammad scratched him aside. It was a wonderful thing. So, so Mick, sh we're, um, share with me what musicians today, young musicians, you are following and whose music from this young generation are you listening to? I really like Bruno Mars. I think he's doing good work. Lady Gaga, when she does solo piano work. My wife Anna went to see her in Vegas recently. Phenomenal singer and musician. Uh, there's a band. Uh, Walk off the earth. Who are very creative. You know, I, it's a it's a cacophony out there today. There's so many bands you can make music. If you have a laptop, you can make music. You know. Well, and so and so, you're you're pleased with the with the future of rock and roll and blues in this country. You feel like there are people that are making great music, and and you're you have to look for them. them. You have to look for them, but they're there if you go look. Are you surprised at the popularity of Taylor Swift? I mean, Rick loves Taylor Swift. I mean, Rick is 75 years old and he loves her music. And so, um, I mean, she's just, and she's such a, a an activist for, for women and for what's right in the world. Are you surprised at her popularity? You know, at first I dismissed her as just another teen idol. Then recently I listened to some of her songs. She, she can write. She's a good she songwriter. Can write. You know? so, so I want to ask you too, have you seen Barbie? Did you and Anna go see Barbie? Not yet, but it's All right. on the list, it's on okay. the list. Yeah, I mean, you have to, you, you, I mean, I, I, I don't want to push a movie on my TV show, but it really is, um, it, it is a movie that I think everyone should see. Um, so I, I just wanted to see if you had, because you're such a cool guy. My um, wife is she who must be obeyed. In so she needs to drag you to, to see Barbie be, um, before it's off because you should see it on the big screen. So Mick, uh, as a deep thinker and a man who cares about bringing people together, I want to, to ask you what advice you have for our youth today. I believe that your uh, Anna's ch child and your, your daughter are all grown up as young adults now. And so what yeah. advice do you have for our youth today? My daughter's 35. And she's a cosmologist. She has a PhD in cosmology. Wow. Tell you what I tell her. Everything will be all right in the end. It's not all right. It's not the end. Everything will be all right in the end. 
it's if it's not all right that means all right it's not the end yeah that's very that's that is very gestalt don't you think a little bit yeah i mean i have tremendous faith in the human race fight all the nonsense that we <clears throat> the human race is capable of enlightenment eventually i think we'll get to well, I don't think I don't think you and I will live to see it, but I'm, no. I'm I really do hope that humans can. So that's such an interesting ending to our interview, Mick. Um, I I can't tell you how how happy I am to have spent a little bit of time with you today, and um, to my viewers again, go to MickLeeMusic.com. Yeah, that's they'll find music there and a link to my YouTube site and all that. So, do you ever come back to Vermont? Every once in a while, my traveling days are pretty much done. All right. Well, listen. If you come back to Vermont, I you 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 are a bright light, and an inspiration. And I've loved knowing you. And um, certainly, if you come back to Vermont, I hope you'll you'll stop in and visit with me. And to my viewers, okay. you'll see me at the, you'll see you'll see me at the meadow, Melinda. All right. I'll see you on the menu. I would love that. So to my viewers, thank you for spending time with me and Mick Lee today. It's been such a joy and I will see you all again very soon. Have a great day, folks. Bye-bye.